Good morning, church. Thank you for that. Why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to sing Holy Water this morning. Let's worship it. Come on. Treasures that fade 
of praise. Come on. Amen, church. We're going to sing a new song this morning. It's called Never Lost. And I wanted to uh, teach you guys this chorus before we actually started the song. So it goes like this. You can do all things. You can do all things but fail. Because you never lost a battle. No, you never lost a battle. And I know, and I know that you never will. So let's sing that one more time. I want you guys' help. So sing along. Sing, you can. Sing, you can do all things. Sing, you can do all things but fail. Cause you never lost a battle No, you never lost a battle And I know, and I know That you never will Hey man, that sounds good Miracles when you move Such an easy thing for you to do and your head is moving right now You are still showing up At the tomb of every Lazarus And your voice is calling me out Right now I know you're able For my God Come through a day Let's sing that chorus you can do all things. Sing, you can do all things, but fail. Because you never lost the battle. No, you never lost the battle. And I know, and I know that you never will. Amen. I sing everything is possible. Oh, everything's possible by the power of the Holy Ghost. A new wind is blowing right now, breaking my heart of stone and taking over like a spirit could. And my walls are all crashing down. I sing right. I know you're able for my God will come through again. You can do all things. You can do all things, but fail because you never lost the battle. No, you never lost the battle, and I know, and I know. You never lost the battle. 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 You never will. Come on, repeat you after me. Will. Sing, you've never lost the battle. Let me hear you. Never lost the battle. You never lost the battle. Never lost the battle. You never lost the battle. Never lost the battle. You never will. I sing again. Cause you never lost the battle. Never lost the battle. You never lost the battle. You never lost the battle.
Amen, church. You guys sound amazing. I just want us to lift our voices and worship our God one more time. Let's sing that chorus out. Come on. The thing you can do all things. Sing it out. Sing you can. You can do all But fear, because you never lost a battle. No, you never lost a battle. And I know, I know that you never will. Let's sing it again. Sing you can. Well, you can do all. Lift your voice. Sing. It's because you've never lost a battle. No, you never lost a battle. And I know. You guys can be seated. Well, now is the time in our service where we give of our tithes and take communion together. And when it comes to our giving, things will be looking a little bit differently for these next couple months due to us not being able to pass the baskets. But we have many ways for you to give. The first way for you to give is by going online and visiting our website at 1c.church. Another way is by downloading our church app on your phone. Another cool thing we have is this QR code, which is up on the screen. All you have to do for that is get out your phone, get out your camera, and place the camera over the QR code, and it will send you a link to be able to give. We have a new giving kiosk out in the lobby, so if you have any questions about how to use it or what to do, feel free to ask people at the Welcome Center. We'd be glad to help you figure that out. You can text the number 217-883-4622, and you can take advantage of our text to give service. And last but not least, you can just drop your tithes and offerings in the boxes on your way out of service this morning. So whether you're here on site worshiping with us or you're worshiping at home online, all of these are easy, simple, convenient ways for you to give. And as you walked in this morning, you should have been handed some prepackaged communion. And with this cup, there are two wrappers on it. So under the first little wrapper, when you pull up, you'll see that there's a little piece of bread. And that bread represents Jesus' body that was broken for us. And then under the second wrapper, there's juice, which represents Jesus' blood that was poured out for us on the cross. And even if you're at home worshiping with us, we still welcome you to take communion with us. And so, today, and so today, we are on the second week of a sermon series we are calling Time to Rebuild. And this week, Shane is talking about endurance. And as I was thinking about endurance, what better example is there than Jesus on the way to the cross? Jesus' final path to the cross was a miserable, miserable one. He was pushed to the limit. First, Jesus was essentially beaten to death by Roman soldiers. He, he, during the beating, he lost a lot of blood and it was, was in terrible pain. But after this beating, he, that wasn't it. He was told to bear his cross, to carry his cross, which would have weighed at least 100 pounds. And he was told to carry it up this hill, carry it up this path. And this path was called Via Dolorosa, which stands for the way of suffering. It was about 600 to 650 yards uphill. So as Jesus was carrying that, once he got to the top, he got to Calvary, which was where he was then crucified and breathed his last breath. Jesus' final path to his death was a terrible one, but yet he endured all of these things to the very end. And he didn't endure because he was this big, tough guy. He didn't endure because he was prideful but he endured because of his love for his children. He endured because of his love for his people. Jesus set the standard to endure, to keep pushing, to never quit, even when times get tough. So the next time you're going through a season, a time of trials and suffering, just remember that we serve a God who suffered far greater than we ever will. But not only that, he is with us every step of the way. So let's pray. 
Dear God, I thank you for this morning, the opportunity to come here and to lift up your name, to, to sing and worship that you never fail. And God, I thank you for the great sacrifice that you made for us on the cross. And God, I don't think we fully comprehend the suffering and the pain that you went through, not just physically, but spiritually. But God, we thank you that you endured all of these things that in, and in the end, you gave your life for us. And thank you for setting the standard to never give up, even when times get tough. So help us remember your sacrifice as we take communion this morning. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Good morning to all of you who are watching online. So good to be back with you guys this week. We are continuing today in our series called Time to Rebuild as we're studying in the book of Nehemiah. You know, I think it's safe to say that if we all had a choice, that we would choose to live a life without trials, without hardships and challenges. You know, no pain, no suffering. And I think that it's safe to say that we would want the exact same thing for our kids and for our, our grandkids. Well, psychologists... Jonathan Haidt, he came up with a hypothetical exercise. He said, to imagine that you're about to have a child be born. And just before your baby is born, you're handed a script of their lives. And you have an opportunity to read the entire story before they're born. And then you're given an eraser. And you've got five minutes. You've got five minutes to where you could edit their story. Now, what would you read in their story? You might read, you know, different trials, different hardships that they're going to endure. You might read that your child is going to be born with a learning disability. Reading comes easy for all the other kids, but for your kid, it's going to be a real challenge. You might also read that your child gets into high school and has a a really great friend, but that friend ends up dying of cancer. You might read that your child is able to get into the college they've always wanted to get into, but then a couple years in, there is a car accident. And your child is involved, and for a couple of years, your child's going to really struggle with depression. You might read that your child grows up and gets a really great job, but then a global pandemic hits, and then your child loses its job and has to file for bankruptcy. But before your kid is born, you get the opportunity to read the whole script of their life, and then you're given an eraser, and you've just got five minutes to edit it. So the question is, What would you erase? I think most of us, we would frantically, we would erase the disability, learning disability, the car accident, the financial troubles. We would want them to live a life without some of those challenges and some of those setbacks. But stop and ask yourself, is that really what's best for them? You know, what if you erase the one thing that's going to teach them how to be compassionate? What if you erase the one thing in their life that's going to teach them how to find joy in spite of their circumstances? What if you end up erasing the one thing that that God is going to use the most in their life? What if you erase the the pain or the sorrow that's going to end up being the thing that God uses for enormous kingdom good? And I don't know a whole lot in life, but I do know that the number one key to spiritual growth is not sermons, it's not worship, it's not small groups, and it's not books. 
The number one contributor to spiritual growth is pain. It's suffering. It's challenges. It's setbacks. When the walls of life have have crumbled around us, it is the best opportunity that we have to grow in our faith and for God to be glorified. And today, we are going to continue on in the book of Nehemiah. The walls have fallen in the city of Jerusalem. They've, as a matter of fact, they've been destroyed for over a hundred years. And as we read through Nehemiah's story, there is a bunch of places where it's easy for us to think, you know, surely, surely God could have erased this. You know, did it really have to happen this way? Couldn't have God spared Nehemiah from a few of these things from happening? Last week, we learned that Nehemiah, he was born a, a slave in a foreign land. And then when he gets older, he ends up being the the king's cupbearer, which is still a slave's job. And then one day he hears the news that the temple and the walls of his hometown have been destroyed in Jerusalem. They've been completely burned up. And the Bible tells us that in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, Nehemiah, he says, When I heard this, I sat down and wept. And the temple and the walls, those are the things that we try to erase in life. It's the the hardships, the challenges, the difficulties. But right here, right here is the start of a rebuilding story for Nehemiah. And in this series, what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to find some rebuilding projects in our life. You know, what are some things in your life that have fallen apart? What walls have been torn down and need to, to be rebuilt? Last week we said whenever you find yourself asking the question, what am I supposed to do now? The most important thing that can ever be done is prayer. And this is a theme that we see all throughout the book of Nehemiah. When things start to fall apart, when the story doesn't go as planned, Nehemiah prays. And today we're going to talk about another rebuilding block that I believe that is essential, and that is endurance. Any successful rebuilding project is going to require endurance. And some of you, you already know this because you've been a part of a a rebuilding project or maybe a remodeling job. And we all know it's easy to to start a job like that strong, but it is tough to continue to stay strong and keep going. Endurance is that strength to keep moving forward when everything in you just feels like quitting. Endurance is that the ability to take one more step when you just don't feel like you've got it in you. And that's exactly where we're going to find the people of God today in our story as they go about this rebuilding project. There's going to come a point where they feel like giving up, where they feel like quitting. At the beginning of Nehemiah chapter 2, the the king can see that Nehemiah is upset and he asks him why. Let's look together at Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. It says, So the king asked me, Why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified, but I replied, Long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, Well, how can I help you? So Nehemiah, he explains what's going on, and the king says that he wants to help. And Nehemiah, he asks him for permission to go to Judah and take on this huge responsibility of rebuilding the city. And the king not only gives him permission, but he also gives him all the resources that he's going to need. But almost immediately, almost immediately we see that opposition hits. And I think that for all of you, for anybody that's going to ever be involved in any kind of rebuilding project, the first thing that I think that you need to know is you have got to expect opposition. You have got to expect opposition. That, that's why endurance is required. Whenever you follow God's call to to put together something in our world that Satan has destroyed, opposition is going to come. So we have got to expect it. But I think sometimes what we do is we say, well, because God called me to this, there, there shouldn't be any opposition. But we know that biblically that isn't what we find. And I think it's also important that we know that Nehemiah, he wasn't facing opposition because he was doing something wrong. No, he was facing opposition because he was doing something right. And I'm sure that there was a point in this project where Nehemiah thought, well, maybe I missed God's plan here. Maybe, maybe I tried to force this because if this is what God wanted me to do, I wouldn't be running into all these problems. But we know that's not how it works. When we experience opposition or whenever we experience obstacles, oftentimes it's because we're doing something right, not necessarily because we're doing something wrong. But unfortunately, so many people quit 
whenever opposition comes about. Instead of enduring, they throw in the towel because they miss this point right here. You know, it's the wife that says, I just don't love my husband anymore. It's just too difficult. Maybe, maybe I miss the person that God wanted me to marry. So she interprets the hardship as this is maybe God's, uh, God's way of closing that door. Or somebody will say something along the lines, well, we, we prayed about the job, but it just hasn't gone well, and we haven't been able to sell our house. Maybe, maybe this isn't what God wants us to do. But I think it's more than, more than likely that you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. Because if you are a part of rebuilding, you have got to expect opposition. And Peter, he writes to the suffering church, and he says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, he says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Whenever you partner with God to be a part of rebuilding something that is broken, you have got to know that there is going to be opposition. Now real quick, let's look at two different types of opposition that I think we'll face. The first is discouraging people. We will face discouraging people. All throughout the, the book of Nehemiah, there are people that come alongside and they try to, to discourage him. They try to stop him. Let's fast forward a couple of chapters. Let's look at Nehemiah chapter 4. Let's look at verses 1 through 3. It says, Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think that they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think that they can make something of stones from rubbish heap and charred ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was standing beside him, remarked, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. And so these guys, they're, they're making fun of them. They're doing all that they can to try to discourage them. And this is a theme. We see this all throughout the book of Nehemiah. There was seven different times that we read that these people, they were, they were making great progress in their rebuilding efforts. And then every time we read something along the lines that says, when they heard. You see, they, they started to move forward, but there are others who are trying to stop them. They're trying to stop these rebuilding efforts. And I think that we all have had people like that in our lives. You know, it's people who discourage you. People who say the wrong thing at the wrong time. And the one thing that I've discovered is it's always the people that you least expect are the ones that bring this discouragement on. You know, it's the spouse. You, you tell your spouse that you've made this decision to give your life to Jesus Christ and be baptized, and you expect for them to be excited about it. But instead, they just roll their eyes. Or you make some changes in your family, and you you're, 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 you're tell your family, you know what, we're going to change things up. We're going to change our priorities up a little bit. But then your friends don't really get behind you. In fact, your friends seem to be discouraging you. Now, why is that? Why do those things happen? Well, the reason it happens is because you're rebuilding. It's a threat to them. Just like what we see right here in the book of Nehemiah. When you begin to rebuild something in your life, you're going to have friends or you're going to have family. Or you're going to have neighbors who aren't going to like your rebuilding. And the reason that they don't like your rebuilding is because they feel like it's an indictment against them. They feel threatened by your rebuilding. So don't be surprised whenever God calls you to move, whenever God calls you to change things up, to do same, some things differently. Because when the rebuilding project begins, there are going to be people who are around you, people who are in your life that do not support it. And as a church, I would love to see us make a commitment to encourage others who are trying to rebuild. Find someone in your life who is rebuilding and encourage them. Because the right word at the right time can make all the difference in the world for someone. But as Nehemiah faces this opposition of discouraging people, we see that the progress, it continues. Let's look at verse 6 in chapter 4. It says, at last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city, for the people had worked with enthusiasm. And this is good, right? You know, the people, they have now reached that halfway point. But I think any of us that have ever been a part of a remodel project, a rebuilding project, we know that the halfway point, it means nothing, right? And at verse 10, they've reached that halfway point, and the people start to wear out. Let's look together at verse 10. It says, then the people of Judah began to complain. 
The workers are getting tired and there is so much rubble to be moved. We will never be able to build the wall by ourselves. So they come to Nehemiah and they say, hey, we have given this our best effort, but just look around. There is still so much work that needs to be done and there's so many broken pieces and everything is still a mess. So another form of opposition that we're going to face is disappointing progress. We see it right here. It's disappointing progress. We work hard at something for a little while, but then we look around and everything is still a mess and there is just still so much that needs to be done. And we know that it is hard to endure through that. And I realize that some of you, you're at that point right now. You've done some work. You've made some effort, but there is a part of you that says, you know what? My kids are just too old to rebuild that wall. My marriage is just too broken. My friends are, are too better or we're too far into debt. You see, you've made some progress, but then you feel like you've just got so far to go, so you feel like quitting. Well, when there's discouraging people, when there's disappointing progress, when we're trying to endure, what, what should we do? Well, I think Nehemiah gives us just a couple of simple lessons. The first lesson that he gives us is to keep praying. Nehemiah shows us that we need to keep praying. Now, when it comes to rebuilding, I realize that most of us, we would like, well, like a step-by-step -step instruction. Here's step one, two, and three of what you need to do. But this is it right here. We have got to keep praying. Too many of us, we have tried to rebuild on our own. We've read self-help books before. We've went and we've got counseling. And those things, they can be great things. Those things can be good, but we've missed this point right here. We have got to keep praying. More than 12 times in this book of Nehemiah, he just continues to pray. And the people, they, they come and they oppose him in chapter 4. And I want you to hear his prayer. Let's look together at Nehemiah 4, verses 4 and 5. It says, Then I prayed, Hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads, and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. And here is a prayer where he is praying about those who oppose him. Now, I said he's praying about them. He's not praying for them. He's more praying against them. But you need to understand why. The reason that he's praying against them is because they are opposing the work of God. They, they keep coming at him. They continue to come at him. And very rarely does Nehemiah ever stop and actually interact with him. Instead, he just continually, he takes their discouragement and he hands it over to God. He takes the discouraging people in his life and he says, God, here they are. God, I need you to deal with this. I, I'm going to stay faithful to what you've called me to do. God, I'm going to stay faithful to who you've called me to, to be in my home and in my family and in my spiritual walk. But God, there's these people over here. And these people, they're trying to slow me down. And if I stop and I interact with them, that's exactly what's going to happen. They're going to slow me down. So God, I need you to deal with them. So here they are. God, you deal with this. And Nehemiah, he continually endures through prayer. And that's hard for us. Because most of us, whenever it comes to prayer, we think about praying for a couple of days and then we expect for God to do something. But Nehemiah, he consistently endures in prayer. And in your rebuilding project, whatever that might be, you have got to continue to pray. So these people, they come at Nehemiah four different times. And they come at him with a letter. And this letter essentially says something along the lines of, hey, you need to stop what you're doing. We need to get together and we need to talk. So they try to distract him. And you better believe that if Satan can't discourage you, he's going to do all that he can to try to distract you. And four different times, we see that Nehemiah's reply is the same one that we see in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 3, whenever he says, I'm engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? And I love that response. And so the, the second lesson that Nehemiah gives us is to keep building. We have got to keep building. And I know, I know that many of you, you are tired. I know that many of you, you've not made the progress that you thought that you would have made by now. But you need to keep praying and you need to keep building. If you have an unexpected expense and it is a big hit to your debt-free plan, you've got to keep building and you've got to keep praying. If your spouse responds to your efforts with criticism and sarcasm, you need to keep praying and keep building. 
If you're waiting on God to answer a prayer about a job or about a move or about a pregnancy, you need to keep praying and keep building. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So don't give up. Keep building. And I know for some of you right now, you are at a time where you feel like you've worked. You feel like you have tried and you just feel like giving up. You feel like quitting. But the point where you're most likely to quit is the point where you are most likely to break through. The point where we're most likely to say, I can't do this anymore. I quit. I give is the point where we're about to gain enough momentum that we're going to be able to turn the corner. So don't give up. Don't stop here. Keep praying. Keep building because you are closer than you have ever been before. So the people, they reach this halfway point and they endure and they, they, they push through. And, the, and then Nehemiah chapter 6 records that the wall was completely built. It was finished. And after hearing all this opposition that they faced, we would think that it took months or even years to complete this wall. But the Bible says that they completed this project in just 52 days. You know, and I think what happens with us is we, we, we give things in life our best effort. We do it for maybe five or ten. Sometimes we might even go 15 days. We really try to make some attempts to do things differently. We, we try to make some changes in our life. But my guess is, is if we would stay at something for 52 days, we'd probably start to see the top. We could start to see where things were going to turn around for us. So what we have to do is we have to endure we have got to keep praying and keep building. And I think that Jesus is the perfect picture of this for us. The Bible tells us that what he did on the cross was endurance. So whenever you feel like quitting, whenever you feel like giving up, just think about what Jesus did on that cross for you, and you will have the strength that you need to endure. Let's pray. God, you are good. And Father, we live in a world that is so broken and a lot of our lives have been completely shaken recently, Father. And we know that when it comes to taking on a rebuilding project, we need you. And so, Father, I pray that we will draw in closer to you. Father, when the opposition comes, I pray that we will continue to ignore the enemy and we will keep building. But Father, we pray that you will be the center of whatever it is that we're trying to rebuild in life. God, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together and worship you. And so I ask right now for those who are struggling that you just provide a peace and a comfort that only you can give. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we go into our time of ministry, I just want to encourage you, if there's anything that you need to be praying about today, just do so in your row. Just cry out to God because he is a God who hears and a God who heals. Why don't you stand as we sing this next song? Every man, every 
For this man who needs amazing kind of grace Forgiveness and a price I couldn't pay I'm not perfect so I thank God every day In the fire and the fire. 